Webster interviews Grammy Award winning soloist and Māori Taonga Pūoro specialist Jerome Mako Kavanagh. No Ngāti Maniopoto, Mō Kaipātia, Ngāti Rangi ki Whanganui, Ngāti Tuwharetoa me Ngāti Kahungunu. Jerome shares his early beginnings in Taonga Pūoro, how his practice evolved from working in Kura and Kohangareo and how the settling practice of Oroatua was developed. Fascinated with sound that activates human power, Jerome furthered this with technology and has travelled the world performing with Taonga Puoro in a modern context, and has a composer's residency at Victoria University. Whakarongo mai e te iwi. Tēnei te mihi atu ki a koe, um, Jerome, um, e yeah, te whakai, te ara mai ki te kōrero, i wau kōrero e pāna tō um, hairinga, e mau ana koe, tēnei ona taonga pūoro, he mea mana wa mau, he kaitiaki o tēnei taonga, so ko te tūmana ko, e, yeah, ka pai haere tō taua nei kōrero ke mui a taua, tērā pia ka ke whakatau te tēnei wāhanga mā te karakia ka whakatau eh, ki a hopu mi iwi nei o nga kōruru uh, yeah. so uh, ko rangi ko papa ko puta ko tāne mahutu ko tanga rō ko tāwhiri mātea ko haumi e tiki tiki ko rua umo ko kolongo ko whero ko tū matauinga toko nārangi ki runga a papa tūa nuku ki raro ka puta ki te whaiao ki te awa mārama puritia e te tauro o te rangi ki a tīna ki a whena Ki a toka te mana wanui, tīna toka te mana wanui ki hea, tīna toka te mana wanui ki rangi nui etu nei, ki papatua na kungu e tākato nei. Ki tēnā ki tēnō tātou te whanau ngā whanau ngā me ngā piri ngā kāra ngā maha āpiti hona ki te māwiwi i tāmi ane i te pauritanga. He manā ki tiaki ana i tēnei o nā mahi kei mui i a, i a taua, i a tātou e hui hui mai nei. Ki a whakawhiti whiti ngā kōrunu, uh, kei wainga nui i a taua, E ko te tūmanako ki a taupae i tēnei o nga kōrero, ki a pai te au, a te riri o nga hui nei o nga reo, i nga oro, i nga kōrero, kei wainga nui i a tau i tēnei rangi. So koe nei anō ko taupae i tēnei o nga kōrero, a e ronga whakiria ki ki ronga ki a tūna. Tūna. Hau mi e hui e. Tai ki. Once again, brother, good to see you. And um, yeah, good to be here on this kaupapa. Um, spreading the love, <laughs> Tonga Puoro, and you know, I know you and I were quite passionate about this uh, kaupapa, mm. so yeah, it's great that you've um, yeah, arrived here as part of the Home Manu Collective to um, yeah, share your story, mm. and um, pā ho atu ki te ao. Mm. Once again, welcome brother. Che, kia ora. Yeah, so as you know, uh, with James Webster ho, nō te whāna ui rata rawa ko tana, uh, yeah, nō tainu i waka. Koe nei uh, tāku e, e mi atu ki a koe. Mm. Nau mā hara mai tau mai. Ei, ki a ngā mihi. Te ngā mihi. E, e te tua kana nei. Te nei te mi atu ki a koe. Um, Kōru a hoki. Te kai mai o te rā nei. E, me nga whānau whānau e whakarunga na. Um, te nei te mihi. Te nei te mihi. Te nei te mihi. Ai, ko aurangi tamaunga. Um, rangi tīkai te awa. Ma ko kōmi ko te kai na tūturu. Ko mō kai po atea. Um, Ngāti Rangi, Wanganui, Kahungunu, um, and Maniapoto, uh, Matakore, uh, se tainu i waka hoki. Nā reire e te whanaunga, Maniapoto, tēnā koe. <laughs> mō tō uh, afina, mō tō manaki, tioki, 
tau tsoko ki a hau, um, kai rune i taku huarahi puoro hoki, e mai i Aotearoa, puta noa ki te ao, um, i te nei te mihi, te nei te mihi, ko Jerome tōku ingoa, as uh, Richard used to say, the mayor of Taihape. <laughs> <laughs> the president. president. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks bro, thanks for having me on, it's um, awesome. Awesome to always awesome to call it all to you. So yeah, I suppose we we'll just kick it off. Uh, tell us about yourself and your background in Tonga Pūro. You know how sort of yeah, how you got into it, really. Um, so how I got into Tonga Pūro was um, oh, well, the first time I saw Tonga Pūro was um, through my nanny. In our whānau, we, we had a couple of kōwauwau in the old case, um, you know, of taonga that our grandparents had. Yeah, and I used to look at those, and I didn't actually know what they were, because sort of growing up, I, th- I thought um, Māori musical instruments was a raku-raku, you know, and um, we didn't really see that much. Of just those ones in the case, two, two um, wooden ones uh, made of tōtara, and um, no one really knows where they came from. They're just in there. So I assume they're sort of ones that are from Tupuna. Were they carved or were they just quite plain? Or? Um, quite quite plain, just like the carvings at the end, you know, the waha. And um, both of them were of a similar size with three finger holes. And um, those were just things we weren't really allowed to touch, you know. They were in that cabinet. And sometimes um, the cabinet was opened and, you know, for different reasons but you know just growing up as a kid we didn't really know what those were and just you know if we got too close we'd get a whack or something you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah well, so um and then the first time I saw Tonga Puro being played I think it was um and might have been Joe Malcolm because he used to live in Mataroa I'm pretty sure he was a teacher at the school there and so yeah, like I can't be 100% sure it was him, but basically what happened was we had a pōhiri at our marae and this fella came on to the marae and he, he was doing his kōrero and that and then he was playing like a little pūpūrangi, you know, little shell. I saw that and, whoa, you know, that was in the 80s, I think, or maybe 90s. Yeah, and then, yeah, my nanny would sort of talk about um, different Tonga Puro, but not really referred to them as that. You just say, oh, these are our musical instruments. And it was while we were having a feed of boo boos, she, yeah, I wasn't that keen on them, but they were hocking them back like a, there's no tomorrow. And yeah, and then she said, you know, this is this is what that koro was playing, and they're our musical instruments. So yeah, she sort of laid the seeds. And because, uh, you know, we're a gumbu capital of of the of the world, Taihape, and so we're out on the farm a lot and um, you know, going ealing and out in the Ngahere hunting and all that sort of stuff. So I yeah, I spent a lot of time in the bush, you know, and um, really appreciated the bird calls and we had a lot of kurimako and tui and um, I was always interested in the bird calls and um I was sort of like one of those weird cousins that would climb the trees and listen to the manu and try and mimic them with my voice. That was kind of like my little party trick um, that I could, um, you know, I had a high-pitched voice so I could, you know, um, mimic their songs through my voice. Yeah, and then wasn't really until I was in my, like, early 20s, I went overseas to Australia and then I got into all sorts of mischief, you know, and um, and I got a bit... Um, I got a bit sick, you know, I was tattooing around with different um, things, drugs and all that sort of stuff. And then I went, I sort of went into like a depressive state, you know, because I'd sort of grown up in the rural and then tried to do the city and it, I couldn't really handle it. So, yeah, then I, what happened was I had a few suicide attempts in Melbourne, uh, tried to hang myself oh. and then, yeah, and then I came home and... um was sort of wasn't really that common then for you know the momore and so um, my whanau didn't really know what to do so we they took me to Wanganui we went to see um, um, Auntie Tari and her son Pa here and they sort of helped um, bring me into the 
health system. And luckily there was um, an organisation that were Māori and so I went into there and then they took me to uh, like a psychiatrist and then yeah, he listened to me talk for about 10 minutes and then he quickly prescribed me some pills. Meds. And then the meds. Some meds, some meds, yeah. And then I went to, yeah, then we were at the chemist getting those and then, and then I went on those. I was on them for about six months. And, um, yeah, the psychiatrist there diagnosed me with bipolar and, um, you know, real fast, um, real fast track to being a zombie, basically. So, yeah, I was really tired all the time and out the game. Anyway, part of that was that one of my caseworkers was one of our whanaunga from Awawanganui, and he would come and pick me up every Wednesday, and then he will take me into the ngahere and we'd just walk. We'd walk, and um, at first I was a little bit hoha because I thought he was going to sort of like solve all my problems and all that, and then... Yeah, but he was real Māori, gentle fella, and he just encouraged me to just keep walking. Like we'd be walking for four, five hours into the ngāhere. <laughs> and then um, and then he would do this really cool thing where we, he would come into this part where there was some really old rako, and he would, like, talk to the rako and, and ask, Ngā wai yofi tēnei tama. And because I, um, I was in my early 20s and I was, you know, I thought, Ah, this fella's out the gate, like, the gate. and then you'd hear the wind blowing through the leaves of a certain rako, and then so, so then he would tell me, right, go and sit down with your back against that rako, and you know, sit down, and um, your job is to ata you know, just to listen, and then he'd he'd say, oh, I'm I'm gonna go off this direction, but I'll come back and get you, and he would leave me there for like. Two or three hours, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and then I sort of was quite ready at the time, you know, because I was like, "This fellow's just like, you know, he's just doing this taking job the and piss. Taking the yeah, piss. yeah, taking the <laughs> piss." Um, but once I calmed down and I started to listen to the tayo, then it was like quite amazing. So yeah, we'd do that every Wednesday, and then there was. After a wee while, I'd just be going in there every day. Um, even if sometimes I couldn't sleep, I'd get up and go in there. Um, in this um, beautiful ngahere, it's called Rongo Kaupo. It's sort of um, on the western side of Ruapehu. There's a beautiful ngahere leading up into the mountain. So, um, yeah. And during that time, you know, I really started to tune into all those different sounds of the manu and the ngarara and, you know, even the branches rubbing against each other, making this kind of like orchestra of nature, you know, and I'd really loved it. And and uh, sort of coinciding with that, I found this little puka puka that was uh, Matuahirini, Melbourne, and um, the Midwritten, and it was a wharekura book, and it just had a few pictures of Taungapuro and, you know, he puka called it all on um, Atsuatanga and Hinerauka Tauri and I so I, I really started to get quite focused on what are you know what are these and remembered some of my childhood and some of those kōwairo that we had and and then for about an, a year I would just make me a little carving studio and just try and make those taonga from that book Sweet. just by looking and sort of going into like a, a wānanga with myself and yeah, so that's that's where it all started. And so when you were sort of on the meds and going through that stuff, were you in your mid early twenties or mid twenties or I was twenty two. Yeah, twenty two. Oh yeah. Yeah. And you know, it was a time because I was actually a school teacher. I was and I was a primary school teacher in a bilingual unit prior to going to Australia and um so it was quite a it was still really racist, like you know, people could just say really horrible things about our Māori kids. And because I was in the bilingual unit, you know, we were sort of, we had this little classroom off from the school and we were like doing term, there's all the naughty kids and, yep. you know, all that sort of stuff was quite, um, yes. it just slowly ground me down, you know, and then that's why I just thought, oh, if this place I'm, I'm off, I'm going to Aussie, you know, which wasn't a great idea. But, but you know, without that part, I probably wouldn't have come into this mahi because I mm. like I hit hit rock bottom 
was in, in the darkness and um and I feel like those sounds of the kowowo, you know, really drew me out of the darkness and, yeah. and gave me some purpose that I felt happy about. And, it was uh, like your hinātori, eh, that, that speck of light that eh? yeah. drew you out of the darkness, eh? True, because that's it, eh? And so like in retrospect, they, we sort of go through bad things in our life, but it, you know, sets a platform to who we become, you know. Yeah. So, um, you know, and Richard, ah, I shouldn't have done this, shouldn't have done that. But, you know, if you hadn't done that and hadn't done the other thing, you know, you wouldn't have ended up where you ended up. So, you know, it's all relative, eh? It's, it depends on how you look at it. Yeah, true that. And so, you know, you got drawing into it and then so how did it evolve for you from there oh so yeah after about a year of making and sort of like because because i didn't really have anyone to show me how to play them so i'd be making 20 kawaii before i could actually get a sound because i was making all the bad designs and you know and then um yeah and so i i built i built up over time how to sort of play them confidently and then I did enjoy being with the tamariki at Kura, but I didn't enjoy the kind of like setup and the system of how Kura works. So what I decided was, okay, I've got 10 taonga pūro now, and now I'm going to go into around all the Kura and kohanga and my sort of rohe, sort of around that kahui maunga and just try and share them. And I, I did it as a koha. I basically, one week I'd walk into the Kura and tell them, oh, look, I've got these taonga. I want to share them with the kids. It's a gold coin donation and, you know, what's the date I can come in. And then I set up sort of like a 50, 50 schools around our rohe and just, just hit them all in, in the space of like three months. Yeah, so that's really, that's how I got, you know, like the kids were equally part of me being able to present them because, you know, if you're working with tamariki and you're not on, they'll just, they'll just shout out things like, this is boring or... You know, like, <laughs> and um, yeah, I, had, I used to have my putorina, which I found quite hard to play. And sometimes I'd be saying, oh, the, hey, this is a putorino, kids. Like, this is what it sounds like. And then I'd be sitting there like, <laughs> you know, trying to, <laughs> trying to get a sound. Day. So I wasn't really proficient enough to share, but it's just that the, it's like, you know, there was no one really else to share with them. So I just... So I had to hone my skills quickly to be able to, you know, cater for the kids, really. I had a, like, kind of a rapid learning because of that pressure of being in front of our tamariki and mokopuna. You know, that they really, you know, that, that was the whittle, like, what you got, matua, yeah. you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Show us your stuff, mate. <laughs> yeah, and then, yeah, you know, depending on that, though, you, you got your feedback, eh? Got your instant feedback. Eh? Instant feedback. You know whether you've captured them or not. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So, you know, in terms of um, Tonga Puro, what is it you specialise in or, you know, do you specialise or, you know, say Pūra, Kautsikanga, Atuatanga, you know, pertaining to particular Tonga Puro, et cetera? Yeah, sort of, I try and do it all really, like just out of necessity. So I think, yeah, probably my longest mahi and main specialty would be going in to share with the tamariki and the rangatahi and, mm. you know, touring around all the kura and, mm. and kohanga and colleges. And and um, that's, yeah, I've been doing that for a long time and still enjoy doing that. And Yeah, because I've noticed on a lot of your feeds and, um, you know, your social media platform, that's <laughs> um, your... Um, you know, you've developed this thing called um, Oroatua. Mm. Could you talk to us a little bit about what that is for you and how that's come to be? Yes, yeah, so the Oroatua came from that time that I was with the kids. So what would usually happen once I got my flow on and I could actually present something quite exciting for the kids, um, what I noticed was at the end of that presentation, the kids would be quite hypo. You know, and I and I started to sort of think, oh shit! Like I'm sending them back to their classes, like quite energized, energized, yeah. And it was a little kotiro who she must have only been about seven or eight, and this was at a kura in Turangi, and she she goes, oh Matua, like, do you reckon you could play 
you know, could we have a little wakata? We'll lie down and you play your pūro for us. And, and um, so then we slotted that in at the end of that. So for 10 minutes, we'll get the tamariki and the, and the kayako lying down and then I'll just play the pūro sort of in a gentle, relaxing way. And then, and then that would, you know, really bring them back to sort of like, you know, a sense of tone. And then we noticed also some kids would start having a tangi. Some people would go to sleep, even the teachers, you know. Mm. Yeah, and then I guess just reflecting back on how it helped me in terms of my own hauora and coming out of that space. It's probably about six or seven years ago, I I started to um, just really think about how they're healing tools for us and for our people. So the kind of go into another little wānanga and talk with my whānau about what's an appropriate name for this because, you know, you can say, oh, it's Māori sound healing, but it's mm. but it just needed a kupu Māori to express what that was. And so, yeah, we Oruatua was the sort of name. And, you know, Oru was a, a name that everyone's familiar with and and then the Atua is really in reference to you know, our atua tanga and those sounds that they come from, Rokatauri and Tane and Hinemoana and Tangaroa. Yeah, that was the beginning of it. And my idea was at first to go to Marae, but a lot of our whānau were sort of like, oh, I don't know about this. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know? yeah, they weren't really thinking. One of my friends is a yoga teacher in um, Hongoeka in Plymouth, and she said, oh, come to my studio. Like, you can play at the end of my yoga sessions and so um, I went along and done that and yeah and then I, so I started to really do it more with yoga people first now that I look back I think oh that's good because they were sort of like uh, not my, not guinea pigs but you know you can sort of test it out and see what works with them and then over time as that kind of built and I went overseas and did it a lot um, you know then it was sort of like there was a point where it changed over and then our whanau were more receptive to that and and that's when I really started going back into marae and I'd always go into the kura and continue to do that. But, um, yeah, so I think now it's really starting to hit its straps. Mm. At the moment, we're doing a, a rangahau through the Health Research Council of New Zealand have given us some booty to really capture the kōrero from the whānau about, you know, how that might help them. So, yeah, it's pretty cool. Mm. So another thing that I've noticed with what you do mm. is, you know, you have uh, you use a looper and stuff like that. So you know, in your in the way in which you deliver things, um, for myself too, I've always thought about doing that. Like way back when they first started coming out, but just on this, technically, I'm not really. I just don't want want, want the technology, you know. Yeah. So so it hasn't really happened, but you know, I've heard it being used and. I really like the idea, you know, because as a Tonga Pūoro player, especially when you're a solo player, mm. you know, sometimes you think, oh, man, it'd be good if someone was playing the Pūoro while I was playing this Pūtori no, and it'd be good to have a Pūriri Hua flying over the top, you know, so the, yeah. you know, but then because you're a solo artist, it's difficult to do. And so with yeah. the, you know, with the advent of looping and stuff, it sort of adds another component. So, you know, could you talk to us mm. a little bit about how you, integrate that into your style of pool or playing and how you utilise it in, in what you do? Yeah, well, I think, uh, you know, those times that I um, mahied alongside you and and some of the other whānau horo and, you know, those times where we get to play together and you can listen to, you know, you might be playing your pūtori, you know, and I, like you say, I can play my pūrere hua and then it's, you really start to, I really enjoyed that and then I'll go back and then wouldn't see you for another two years and then it'll be. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I, I started to look around at, oh, you know, and start to, I started to think, oh, what's, you know, what, how can I have that ope or ropu of puro, but with just me, you know? And um, I saw this pop artist, Kimbra, using that, this TC Helicon and you using it with her voice. When I watched her, I was like, far out some of those notes she's hitting sounds like puro. And then I, it sort of, you know, got at the copper, was at this penny dropped down and it was like, far out. Yeah. So I looked into it 
I, I watched some YouTubes like, oh, yeah, okay. And then I sort of took a bit of a gamble and, um, and cause you can only buy them from the state. So I was like, oh, okay. So I saved up and, you know, purchased it and it got sent over. And then I was really like, same with you. I'm a little bit, um, you know, technology is like, whew, it's, you know, it's another, it's another kind of like tanifa. So I, so I just took my time with it and just played around with it and set it all up in one of my rooms at home and, and would just go in there and then I'd, and then I'd look at the clock and then it'd be three hours later, I'd be like, you know, and I was really just enjoying, um, discovering it, what it could do. So yeah. And it's been great because, um, mostly what I do with that is you can sort of layer up. I just work in three. So I'll layer up three different, you know, might be puro titi, utorino, and a kowowo. And I layer them up just in threes because it's kind of easier. It's not too much. And um, I was lucky to get that machine because it makes it really easy. It's a little touchpad. It's real user-friendly. And I never read the book. I just went straight into it and got a sound. And then it was away. <laughs> never and read just, the manual, eh? Didn't read the manual. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So just, just having a tutu and just, um, just putting in time to try and make it work. You know, and it's been awesome because I can, you know, I can use it on stage and festivals. I can use it for the Oruwatua. And one thing it's been really awesome for is like creating stuff for film, you know, because you can make these layers. You can sort of alter and put effects on the different sounds. And so you can, so like a, you know, a dry sound playing a kuwawa in a small room can then sound like you're out in the maunga in the valleys and, you can get that nice reverb and but yeah I'm still learning on it and still learning with it and I've had it for about yeah the same six or seven years and it's been it's been fun like and you know now we're go, going online and, and stuff it's been really helpful as well because because you can you know you can bring in the different sounds and you know you're playing along to the recorded pool or that you just looped up and it's it's still got an element of surprise because you're doing it live and I like tutuing around. I might use the ones from the moana or the ones from the ngahere and sort of, sort of make those soundscapes of, mm -hmm. of those different and natural spaces. Yeah, you've got to thank that therapist for leaving you in the bush for a couple of hours every day, eh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that that's memory, right. That memory recall, eh, bro? Memory yeah. recall, mm. yeah. That's right, bro. Mentioning there, you know, using these um, devices, mm. um, you know, sort of on stage and festivals. Maybe mm. you could talk to us because I know you got this got an international profile and whatnot. So yeah, it's like yeah, maybe share that with our listeners. Cool. Oh yeah, thanks, bro. Yeah, I I was only really going around Kura and doing that sort of mahi, and then um, I lived in London for a little bit and. Um, when I first arrived, what happened was Moana and the tribe, they were coming to Europe and um, they had a Tonga Puro player and a rapper, but he missed the plane. <laughs> no names, no names. Yeah, and it was actually Matua Brian that, because um, I had asked him to make me some Puro and he sent them to London while I was living there. Like he sent me a Puro too and a Kowowo and it was cool, really cool, you know, getting those while I was over there. Yeah, and then he sort of emailed and said, oh, hey, Moana's over there, and I, I think they're looking for a Puro player. So here's her email, go and send her email and see what she says. So, yeah, she she was, she was got back in touch and said, oh, come and meet us. And then I went and met all the, you know, all the uh, A-lister Māori, <laughs> um, tangata rongonui. And then um, next thing I was going to Russia with them and touring around with them and through Europe. And so she really taught me how to be on stage, you know, guided me through how you do that side of things, which was really cool. And, um, yeah, I, I always made to her and um, say she was like my trainer wheels for that sort of mahi, you know, and um, once I got in and sort of toured around with her, but I came back to London and and then started our own band with a Jamaican fella and an English fella and a Welsh fella and we sort of, they really loved the sound of Puro and so they really supported us all to create this music that was sort of a mix of the London R&B, hip-hop, 
house music, you know, sort of sound in the early 2000s and with sort of pool all right in the centre of it all and, and then I'd like sing and, and do karaoke and Māori and, and uh, you know, we'd turn up and to different festivals because there was sort of an interest because it was a bit left field, you know, it was like, oh, people know about Māori in Europe. And so there was an interest and then we'd sort of play our music and then it'd be like, oh, wow, this is different. So Indian music was coming out into this sort of world. Um, Giles Peterson and those sort of people were pushing African music and all types of different world music. So it was just a good timing. We come into that and managed to sort of tour around and, and um, release an album. And yeah, then it just it's just continued. And then, you know, being overseas with you and um, went overseas with another group called um, Small Island Big Song and we toured with other Tonga Puro players from around the Pacific and Indonesia and Asia. Yeah, yeah that looked pretty cool. Um, sort of under that whole kaupapa of um, the migration from Taiwan coming out into the Pacific and across to Africa. Um, so, yeah, went with 12 other different indigenous whānau that sort of had a connection. So, yeah, that was cool. But, yeah, I, I think also... What happens is, and you'd know when you go on a stage and you're with a band or something. You, it's hard to, it's hard to get the pool or into, you know, when you're sort of competing with a bass and big drums, and you sort of just find these little spots where you can put it in, and that's about it. Mm-hmm. And I like doing it; it's cool, but at the same time, it can be a little bit ho ha because because the what, the pool is not being heard necessarily. Yes, so, yeah, dominated by all this. Big sound, eh? Big sound, yeah. Mm. And then I find the soundies, they don't really know how to take you, the engineers, because you're, you've you got quiet instruments and then really loud instruments and then... Yeah, it's hard to mix, eh? For sure. Hard for them to mix, so... Eh? Yeah, I, I enjoy doing the stuff on stage, but not really as much as, say, doing something that's, you know, like the Oruatua or, you know, Mahi Atua or or, you know... um working with you with the karetao, you know, those are more, uh, what do you call it, enhancing for the pūro because they're more of a kaupapa Māori platform as opposed to trying to do like a Western style of music presentation, you know. Mm, sweet, bro. Yeah, that's cool. So, um, okay, so we've sort of gone out there internationally and then out into the world and um, so, you know, bringing you back to, you know, Aotearoa and stuff, uh, as I know you're based here now. Mm. So, yeah, where is it at for you now? Because I hear you're in a, um, you're doing a residency at Victoria University, mm. you know, as a composer. Yeah, maybe tell us a little bit about where Tonga Pūro is for you at present. Yeah, so I'm at Victoria doing a composer's residency, which is pretty cool. I sort of like that idea of trying to go into these spaces and indigenising the space, you know, from our from our sort of more current mahi we're doing with all of you. And and so, yeah, that's really a year to um, to create music and, and do collaborations with the students and a few lectures. That's been pretty cool because... You know, when you go into, say, like a school of music like that, they're very much about the Western style of music. And, you know, there's a C and a D and, a, you know, there's a certain way that you make music. And so it's good to share and also think about, oh, well, what is our music? You know, what is the difference? And just, you know, sort of sharing some of that kind of kaupapa around um, our music comes from the environment. We have an ancestral link to these instruments and they have budako and they they have certain ways you interact with them. So I like that. I like being in this space and sort of working with the next generation of musicians, even even talking to them about if you wanted to work with Taonga or how would you do that appropriately? And then, of course, we got, um, you know, Mahi with Haumanu, which is, which is awesome because that gives a real... Um, collective focus on what are we up to as opposed to what am I up to (laughs) yeah what am I up to like (laughs) yeah so I'm really enjoying the um those changes you know and and having more of a focus on 
maybe the future and how can we share what we've learned from before and the mistakes we made and where are we going together in the future. Mm-hmm. And then really the whole water side of the pool is the, a yeah. big focus, you know, because because now it's... Um, it's the next step, eh, next level. Yeah. Because mm. those are things for myself too, you know, like I've been involved in pool for years and we've always talked about them being healing tools, you know, mm. because, you know... Yeah, all the wānanga that I've done in the past, it's all about slaying their platform and foundations and, mm. you know, getting people, you know, excited about pūoro. But, yeah, you know, but I suppose kia whakatina na tia te kōruru, eh? So it's all about, well, we've talked about it. So what does that look like? You know, hence that sort of research funding you got mm. to research into its functionalities and how, yeah, how how can it be used and how can it be incorporated back into society, back into our culture, you know, as a living entity as as opposed to something our tūpuna did, you know? Yeah. You know, so um, we're going to be tūpuna one day too. So, yeah. you know, yeah, those are all sort of exciting um, things. And, you know, and I suppose, you know, for us as Homeowner Collective and sort of what we're doing, you know, there's a, a new wave of um, pūoro artists coming through and practitioners mm. and makers and mm. stuff like that. So, yeah, you know, you mm. want to share, yeah, start sharing out more kōrero or two to help and aid, you know, the development and the growth and yeah. allow, let people know that, you know, they're not out there by themselves. They're actually, it's a big whānui. Yeah. And um, thanks to the endeavours and the revival sort of, times of hedoni and, mm. you know, mm. haumanu back in the day. Um, mm. Yeah, we can just be part of that evolution and that growth and development. So we feel like we're contributing back, you know, into the pool of mātauranga. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so dreams and aspirations, tonga pool or bro. Yeah, dreams and aspirations. Yeah, I think I think what you just talked about is pretty pretty much sums it up. It's sort of like continuing that mahi. I feel like it's a, a there's almost a second wave of it as well. You know what I mean? At first go it, it was was you know huge, and now we're coming into another big part. You know, and um, and so it's because it's all timing, eh? So it's great timing for us to come back together because uh, I know everyone's been really busy doing their mahi and sometimes we'd come together and it would, it would always be cool and I think that's um, you know, sort of making another big blast at it really and I think yeah the, the thing around the things like how you're sharing rongo aoro and really starting to utilise them in that way is for me anyway that's where the power of it is is in that space, you know, I even um, one time I listened to uh, Matsu Richard talking about that as well. How he he was talking about how that's a part that's really still got a lot of potential because I think all the performing stuffs. It's not that it's all been done, but it's a lot of mahi's been done by you know um, people like yourselves and everybody that's doing and that you know they've taken it into all different directions and into different genres. And and so I think that part's really pretty solid. And I feel like now, from my view and um, perspective anyway, I think the next part's really this part where we're using them as healing tools. And it's probably lots, um, you know, much different to how our tūpuna use them, but also too we have all these modern, you know, issues and, and afflictions and things that are coming at our people and, the rongo of them mm-hmm. and the, the practice, like you say, you know, putting it into practice. And, you, I, you know, always have a soft spot for our kids and, and really trying to present it to them as well and so that they grow up with it because I didn't, mm-hmm. you know, I didn't really grow up with it. Like it was sort of there just, you know, but not in a way mm-hmm. where, it, where it is for our kids. So. Yeah, well, I didn't grow up with it at all. I eh? sort of I just heard it as a young adult and um, just... It hit me. And I was like, "Wow!" Get it, you know. 
Yeah. Bit of follow that little thread, you know, follow that thread. Yeah. Um, yeah, because that, that's how I see the Tonga pool, you know, it's sort of a way of recalibrating who we are as well, you know, through the vibration, through the sounds and, you know, that memory recall, eh, of, you know, of our atua tanga and our, our tūpuna and, yeah. and, and our modern day living, you know. That's right. And trying to sort of re- keep us reconnected to... To the essence, say the essence of who we are, eh? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I reckon you're right there activating, eh, that those sounds activated us when we were at those points and that's what they can, that's the power that they can have for our people. Mm-hmm. And and just in terms of like sound and noise, there's so much, I feel like, polluting sounds now that, are, you know, especially now we're, we're on our devices and phones and I don't know, sometimes at our house with the fun, everyone's on their on their devices and it's like such a, it's so hard to be in the lounge because it's like, you know, tam, our boy's listening to this, our girl's listening to that, you know, mm. partner's listening to something else, you're listening to, it's just like, oh. <laughs> yeah, well, it's true, eh, because you could be all in the lounge, like me and my whanau, we'd be all in the lounge, everybody be on their devices and, you know, with the ear pods in as well. Yeah. So it will be quiet, <laughs> It'll actually be quiet, but you can just hear the noise going on, and you know, yeah, um, yeah, and and everyone's disconnected. You know, it's just like, ah. yeah, you know, and you know, you talk about it, but you know, as a parent, I'm still responsible for that as well. You know, yeah, yeah, that's I right. allow it to happen. You know, and I'm involved in it as well. Yeah, <laughs> so it's sort of like, so it's, you can't really blame your kids for it because you nah. know, you're allowing allowing it to happen as well. So. Just trying to find a balance or, you know, other tools and mechanisms to try and balance things out a bit. Yeah, um, that's right. Yeah. And it could be as simple as going out, hey, go to the ngahere and play your kawaiwo together or go down to the other way and yeah. swing your pūrere hua. Yeah. You know, it's, it's really those those devices, you know. Our t- uh, I feel like our tonga pūro are devices as well, you know. Yeah. And, um, yeah, no, it's like, which one are we choosing? Eh? Yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and sometimes, you know, like, you know, when you're in it as well, you know, you're dragging your kids all over the country and, you know, to all your wālanga and they're, oh, here we go again, you know. <laughs> yeah. So, like, where's my True. iPad, you know? And so you're over there telling everybody, oh, you know, reconnect to your, you know, to your <laughs> ancestry. And your kids over there because they've heard it a thousand times over there right. and the voices is like, Fah. but right. um, you know, I suppose these are the challenges eh, of modern times and just that's right, that's yeah, right, being and doing what you do. Something you said before, you know, you talked about the hinatori of of sound day like you know because it's a it's a light and i suppose light and sounds all kind of the same thing but in, in a different waka but yeah if i could say anything to whanau listening as if you know because you talked about it you you came in you were your you were your young adult and then you heard the sound and then there was something about it that just you were straight there and i feel like if our whanau have that happen to them then whayatu you know because because really, if you didn't follow that thing that effect, you know, had a great effect on you, and the same for me, then I feel like that's an opportunity for our family to go into this mahi, you know, and um, and I think those are natural tohu that, like you said, talk directly to your whakapapa or your your cells, and then that's telling you, oh, this is some mahi that you're naturally built for, like yeah, nice, and um, yeah, so I think that's about it, really, and um, and I'll play our um our nguru to uh, send us off to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this one I, I use for our babies, um, and I just play gently and, and usually, yeah, it used to, used to work really well for our girl when she was like three or four, and then once she got to about five or six, I think she knew the trick, and then she would just keep talking and didn't really work anymore, but... Um, so how I played this for her when she was a baby was just repeating a simple pattern and I'll just repeat that same pattern over and over again for 20, 30 times and then boom, she'll be out to it. But um, 
yeah, as I mentioned, once he got onto the trick, it was didn't work anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Puro tu, puro mai. Mori ora, bro. Mori ora, my bro. Too much. Just, just before we sign off, um, I know that you're, um, you know, you're quite in social media and that it seems. Um, and I know you're sort of doing a podcast series yourself, sort of thing. Mm. So you just want to give that a bit of a plug for the listeners out there. Oh, thanks, bro. Mm. Yeah, um, it's, we call it Oro Atua Kitao. Yeah, which is like Puro Kitao, you know, just sharing it with the world. And um, yeah, it was just some cool little and um, that I shared around um, how we're utilizing the Puro in a, for like self healing and in a whole order sort of type of way. Um, yeah, and we went out into significant places, um, like the place where I went into the bush and with my. Fanonga and you know when I first started my pool journey we went back to those places and recorded in the bush so what's the name of that again? Um, Oro Atua Kiteo Oro Atua yeah. Kiteo so yep if you, yeah. if you want some other perspectives on Tonga Pūro besides this podcast series check it out <laughs> check it out <laughs> um, yeah so once again you yeah, know Jerome um, you know Tahara Mai te Kōrero wau kōrero, uh, e pāna tō haerenga, mm-hmm. uh, i rungi i te huarahi uh, a taonga pūoro, uh, nei rā te mihi atu ki a koe o wau mm-hmm. mahi, uh, hei te tai kaitiaki mō tēnei taonga, mm-hmm. ngā taonga pūoro, uh, ki a mau pai ai koe i wera o ngā mātau ranga, i ngā, ngā wairua tango, ngā atua tango o inei o ngā mahi. Mm. So, yeah, tēnei te mea tiki a koe a hoa. Te mea o kia. Yeah, so, yeah, mā te atua e mana ki tiaki ana ia, ia taua, ia tatu katoa, uh, i whakarongo mai nei, ko e nei mm. o ngā kōrero. Mm. Uh, ko taupa ai te mauri, te mauri o e nei o ngā mahi, uh, e runga whakiri a ki ki runga ki a tīna. Tīna. Hau me hui e. Tāiki. Tāiki. Te mauri ora, brother. brother. Mauri ora, my bro. Ko te piko. Ooh.